All right. Uh, we're going to start <laughs> notes for 5.1. Uh, so uh, that way we can uh, not lose the day of instruction and uh, but still give you an extra weekend to study for your test. OK, so um, we're just going to introduce uh, natural logs and then uh, at the end of the class, we'll have the time to um, to pick up where we left off and do some more um, review for Monday. So uh, spend a minute to copy um, uh, this down here. We are working with natural log functions. We're going to be finding the derivative of natural log functions. And then um, we'll have, we'll have two sections on natural logs, and then we're going to talk about uh, exponential functions, which are inverses of natural log, um, and then explore those derivatives. And then, um, uh, yeah, I guess I have a calendar. We can uh, we'll, we'll work through chapter. This chapter five is over logs and um, exponentials. Okay, so sketch that graph. Uh, if you can um, memorize uh, that graph and those uh, few uh, properties there, uh, it really helps out in terms of um, finding values for natural log uh, values without having to feel like you need to rely on the calculator, um, at least for uh, ballpark values. So, uh, yeah, it's just nice to. Uh, be able to look at or to kind of have an idea what a, where the uh, what a natural log value is without uh, feeling like we're completely lost without you know using other to to estimate or to uh, find that decimal value. Okay, so a natural log graph has uh, it's always um, continuous within this domain. So I mean there is a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. But once the graph starts, it's not going to, there's no, not anything that's going to break. There's no asked over hole that's going to interrupt that interval, that graph. Uh, the graph is always increasing. So it rises, but at a very, very slow rate. Uh, and it's always concave down. So it's always kind of has this, uh, this increasing concave down shape to it. Uh, the domain for the graph is from zero to infinity, so it exists to the right of zero. And the range is all real numbers because it, it goes all the way down to the infinity. It goes all the way up to positive infinity, so all of the y values is covered. And so this uh, graph hits every y value um, uh, from negative to positive infinity. So we're starting with, uh, uh, we are going to talk about logs of other bases, but, but uh, natural log is log base E. And base E um, uh, is, E is an irrational number that shows up a lot in mathematics. So uh, it, 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 a lot of the, uh, we are kind of treating E kind of like as a parent uh, function. And then all the other bases uh, kind of adds to you know, adds a little bit more complexity to it, but you can think of this as a as a parent graph uh, for logs as well as for um, exponentials. So another way of writing natural log of x is uh, log base e of x. So natural log is just a um, 
uh, a shorthand way of say, saying that it's log base E, but a lot of times we're going to just say natural log LN to represent natural log, log base E. Okay. Um, so uh, once you graph this, there's uh, just a couple of things uh, that's going to really help us out. First, understand that there's a vertical asymptote right at zero. There's an order pair at one zero. And there's also an order pair at E1, and E is around 2.7. Basically, if you approximate it, it's around three, okay, less than three, a little bit less than three. Okay. Now, just by using this graph alone, we can estimate a lot of values for natural log that we would otherwise, I think, feel kind of lost uh, without a calculator. But if you just have this graph in front of you, if you can kind of just create a quick graph with these two order pairs and then sketch the graph, you can find a lot of information, at least ballpark values. So I just want to um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So in the space up here, I'm going to write down a couple of, of uh, values here. So natural log of one. Okay. So if I ask you what is natural log of one, you just basically can look at the graph. What's the y value? Natural log of one is equal to zero. Zero, right? So I'm just looking for. Um, so I'm basically practicing evaluating these um, natural log uh, values without feeling like we have to use a calculator. We just use the graph. Natural log of E is equal to one. Okay. All right. Natural log of zero. Does not exist. Okay. So undefined. All right. Yep. If you can create this graph, you won't feel like you have to memorize all these values. You can kind of just read the graph and tell. Uh, natural log of negative one. Undefined, right? It doesn't exist there. OK, uh, natural log of one half. You may not know the value, but you do. Uh, you may not know the value, but you'll know at least it's where. It's what? Negative, right? We know it's negative. It's actually around like negative 0.6. But if you just know that, okay, let's just say negative one half, just so that we can. There's, again, oops, sorry. Um, again, you're not memorizing. Uh, you're just looking at the graph and, and kind of uh, estimating, okay? So the important thing is that okay, you know it's negative, and um, that's enough for us to kind of make some estimations. All right, what about uh, natural log of two? So natural log of two, you know, is somewhere here between zero and one. That's close enough. It's probably around 0 0.6, 0 0.7. All right, but you know it's greater than zero, but less than one. Right? Natural log of three. Yeah, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2. Natural log is a very, very slow growing function. Um, so even if I go all the way to natural log of like 16, it's only going to go up to like maybe three or four. So it's very, very slow. Um, so, you know, look at all these values that we can gather simply by looking at the graph, right? There's no need to, we're not memorizing anything. And we also don't feel like we have to rely on the calculator. We can, we just have some ballpark values. It's really, really going to be helpful when we talk about uh, curve sketching and we're just trying to estimate values but we don't have the calculator in front of us okay okay uh example one uh sketch the graph of natural log of x minus three basically what's happening is um the x minus three is telling us where the vertical asymptote lies so if i set that x minus three equal to zero that tells me where my boundary is so my boundary is at x equals three. So if I just go to three, draw, drop my vertical asymptote there, and then natural log is just going to be a graph to the right of it. So 
care about um, the order pairs. I just want to do a, a rough sketch. And just based off that graph alone, we can determine the domain, right? The domain is going to be basically to the right of my asymptote. So domain is from three to infinity, parentheses three. Okay, uh, draw the function and answer the examples. So example two, here's my natural log graph. We're just gonna briefly talk about limits, but we're not gonna spend much time here just reviewing. So natural log as X approaches zero from the right side of zero. So that means I'm gonna pick a point. Limit means, on one side limit means I'm gonna pick a point on one side of my target and then move towards that target. So I'm going to start on the right side of zero, head towards zero. What's my Y value headed towards? Negative infinity. What if I start to the left of zero? Right, I don't have anything to, to begin with here. Nothing exists here, so I can't even make that movement. So undefined or does not exist. What about the full limit as X approaches zero? Doesn't exist, right? In order for my limit to exist, my graph has to at least approach the same real number y value from both sides. And I have nothing on the right side to left side to compare it with. And even if it did, it's, it's not a real number. It's going to infinity or negative infinity. So it does not exist. Okay, limit as x approaches infinity. That means I'm going to uh, follow the arrow to the right. And where's the arrow headed as I move to the right? Up, oh, positive infinity. All right, um, let's talk about some properties. Um, I'm going to rewrite these properties here, uh, name them and talk about that. Uh, and also example three doesn't require a lot of space. So I'm just going to cut it off in the middle here. I was going to um, write out those full properties um, below next uh, in this space right here. Okay, so here's one property, product property. So product property is this one right here, is where if I have natural log of A times B, I can expand it into natural log of A plus natural log of B. Okay, and these properties are going to be very helpful when we start doing derivatives, because here's the big idea. The idea is that if I have something that is relatively messy, I can break it down into smaller parts which will then allow my derivative process to be a lot easier to work with. So we're going to be using these properties so that uh, we can force our problem into smaller chunks, and then it's a lot easier to handle multiple small problems than a uh, messy uh, large one. Okay. Uh, but sometimes uh, we may be going the other direction where we may decide to condense. If I have natural log of A plus natural log of B, I can Condense it into natural log of AB. Sometimes that is helpful to move my problem along. Okay. All right, let's go to uh, review another property here. This is the quotient property. I have natural log of A over B. So natural log of A over B. Quotient property, I can, if I have uh, the division expression, quotient uh, the expression inside natural log, I can split it up into the difference of two logs. Again, that's helpful. Having to do, find the derivative of this is quite messy, quotient and chain potentially, but if I can break it down into uh, these smaller problems, it just feels a lot easier because I have two individual problems rather than one, small, one large one. And then power property here. Okay, so power property is where if I have natural log of A to the N, 
that exponent is free to come down in front. Now, this feels a little bit like power rule for derivatives, right? Because power rule, we bring down the exponent, but in this case, we don't subtract one from the exponent. But here's the main difference. The difference here is that even though that procedure feels alike, this, when you do that exponent bringing down, you're not changing the value at all. Okay, You're keeping the exact same value. But if you do it with derivatives, then you're changing the, the function completely, right? And the, the, the nice thing about this exponent being able to come down is if you have a, a messy expression that you would rather not go through cha with chain rule, when that exponent comes down, all of a sudden, um, your your variable, your value is a lot easier to work with because that's not a, a, a messy exponent. It's just some coefficient that's hanging out in front. We would much rather deal with the coefficient than an exponent. So, um, but sometimes we may want to go backwards and uh, condense into something that's a little bit um, more uh, helpful. So it really depends on the problem. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, a lot of times we want to go from left to right to get our problems uh, expanded out, but sometimes we may want to push things together um, to um, so that uh, things can be easier to uh, to interpret. OK, so we're going to practice these properties, uh, but there's one that I want to point out that is not a property. OK, not a property. And it's this one that um, I see some students try to apply. So if I have natural log of a plus b and that a plus b is inside my natural log expression, I know it feels like a natural thing to do, but we can't do this. We can't say natural log of a plus natural log of b. And the reason why we can't do that is because the natural log is not independent of a plus b. The a plus b is inside the natural log function, so we can't distribute that natural log through something that's inside the expression already. Um, uh, I think sometimes students feel like this is a uh, natural log is its own variable, but the a plus b is the variable that's inside the natural log function. So when you see natural log of a plus b, you kind of have to leave that alone. We can't expand that. We just have to take um, that uh, form with uh, whatever problem we're working with and just move forward. But we cannot um, clean that up in a different form. OK, um, but we can expand natural log of a times b but I can't distribute the natural log of a plus natural log of a plus b through. Okay. All right, so let's look at uh, this example that's um, next to these properties. Uh, expand natural log of 3e squared. All right. So the 3e squared is inside the natural log expression. What's one property that uh, stands out that we can use? Yes, eventually we'll use power, but we're going to use what first? Product, OK. The reason why we don't do power first is because if we can't bring that two down technically. I mean, in this case, maybe it's not that bad because that's just a three. But yeah, we, we, we shouldn't have to be able to do that because um, that E, that squared only sees a three. Sorry, that squared only sees an E. It doesn't see that three. So but once we separate the E and the three, that too can be more free to come down. So, the natural log of 3e squared, I'm going to expand it using power property, natural log of 3 plus natural log of e squared. So, I'm treating the 3 as my a, I'm treating the e squared as my b, and I'm just splitting them up into easier parts. Okay. Now that I have those separated, what can we do with that second expression? Power property, right? Power property. So that two can be brought down in front. Okay. Any other property that stands out to you that we can use? Uh, not push property, but there's there's something that we can replace and make it a little bit easier looking. Yeah, this natural log of e. What do you know about natural log of e? Equals one. Okay, two times one is just two. Natural log of three is some decimal value. We'll leave it in the exact value form. So natural log of three plus two. Okay, 
Okay, page two. Okay, um, page two, we're going to practice condensing. So condensing is where um, we're basically taking these um, initial properties, these uh, multiple log terms, and we're trying to get it all down to one log expression. So all these um, separate terms, we want to combine it into one. Um, and so before we go through this problem here, let me let me talk about kind of, this is kind of a little bit of a shortcut properties so we don't have to look at um, or think too hard about how to clean up or how to condense. Let's say I had natural log of A plus natural log of B minus natural log of C minus natural log of D plus natural log of E. Okay, so let's say I had that and I asked you to condense. Um, we may try to overdo it and say, OK, I'll put these two together. Then I got to figure out what to do with that C, then the D and then the E. So here's a here's a quick way to just basically we just basically have to find a, a location for these A, B, C, D and E, right? And they're all going to land either in the numerator or the denominator inside my natural log. And then the quick way for us to just know where they are without having to go through a lot of work. You just look to see, is that natural log part of, sorry, are, are those variables or expressions part of a positive natural log or a negative natural log? So anything that's part of a positive natural log, it's just gonna end up in the numerator. Okay? Anything that is part of a, a negative natural log will just end up being in the denominator and they will all be multiplied and divided by one another. We're not going to have any additional subtraction signs once we're inside the parentheses. So here, A, B, and E are all part of positive natural log, so I can just put them all up here. C and D are both part of my denominator, or sorry, part of uh, negative natural log, so they're just going to end up in the denominator. Okay, And we're not going to do C minus D, we're going to do C times D. And everything is being multiplied which is depending on where they go, either the numerator or the denominator. Okay, so that's a quick way for us to know where they go without having to think about, oh, product and quotient. It's just it's easy, easier that way. So we can apply it for this example as well. This two is sitting outside a set of brackets. So let's worry about this natural log, um, getting it down to one natural log. Okay, so we need to find a home for the x, the x plus one, and the x minus one. I'll leave that two alone for now. But basically, I know that everything I underline is going to either be above or below the numerator or denominator of my natural log. So where can I put the x? Top. Where can I put the x plus one? Bottom. And the x minus one bottom as well. Okay, multiply, multiply. The two, I'll just go ahead and put out in front here. Um, we can clean this up a little bit here. We can merge the two parentheses together, ex um, expand this out x squared plus x minus x minus one. And then we can uh, we fix and condense it as much as possible, but there's a, a better place where we can put that too. Exponent. Condensing. That's right. Condensing is where I push everything together into one singular log. Expanding is where I take one log and I break it into multiple parts. Now, having said that, most of our work is going to be with expanding. Okay, expanding is usually going to be 
the property that is more helpful for us from a derivative perspective because we can if we can expand we have we have easier smaller problems to to work through okay so our um derivative rule that we're going to be using for natural log is this okay is u prime over u and the u is just the expression inside the natural log function and u prime is the derivative of my expression and then the u is the original expression from my natural log notice that when you find the derivative of of a natural log expression the natural log goes away you're just left with u prime and u so let's practice that uh, rule for example five y equals natural log of x so y prime equals um, what's my u value? The x. So I'm just going to do what the rule tells me to. To find u prime, I take the derivative. What's the derivative of x? This one. Divided by the original u value, so it's x. That's it. So this is the slope formula for a natural log graph. Okay, number six, y equals natural log of x squared minus five. And we can't do anything with this, right? We can't distribute the natural log through. Uh, it's it's stuck in that form. Uh, so what's our, if we want to find the derivative, we have to just jump into whatever this is giving us here. What's our u value? Yeah, entire expression inside the parentheses. Our derivative is simply u prime over u. What's the derivative of my expression? Yes. Divided by, that's it, that's our derivative. All right, the nice thing about natural log expressions is that uh, even, if the, even if the function gets more and more complicated, we have the ability to break our problem up into into easier problems or smaller parts simply by using a combination of these properties. Okay, so we're going to see how um, uh, these properties will really help us out because right now we there's no need for it. The problem is not complicated enough, but let's look at example seven. Natural log of x squared divided by square root of 2x cubed. Find y prime. Now, this is a messy U value, right? If I want to find the derivative of this, I got to go through quotient and chain. Um, so why not take advantage of properties that will allow us to expand? So treat this like you would if you saw a natural log of A over B. All right, we're not doing anything with derivatives, but we are seeing if we can break this into easier, smaller parts. So how can I expand this out? Yep. Good. I'm going to continue to uh, clean up that second term. The first term is not bad. I mean, I can't expand it. I can bring that two down, but right now I'll leave that alone. But that square root, it does feel a little more complicated here. So I'm going to look to expand that terms further. But first, I can rewrite it as what? 2x cubed raised to the one half. So this is still looking like a, you know, a, 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 a derivative that requires chain rule, but we can avoid that chain rule by doing what? What can we do with that exponent? <laughs> Bring it in front, right? And when we do that, remember that is not a derivative process. That is simply a property. We're not changing the value of it, which is changing the look of it in an attempt to make our calculus step easier. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and do my derivative because 
my U value feels relatively easy, right? X squared is easy to find for its derivative. 2x cubed is easy. So we are expanding, but we kind of want to just know when to stop. Okay. Because we could expand further. We can expand that 2 and x cubed, separate those out, bring the uh, 3 down, bring the 2 down. But it feels like to a point where if you continue expanding, it's almost not worth the trouble because you're writing a bunch of terms. Technically, yes, it's easier, but if your U value already feels manageable, I would just go ahead and jump to the derivative. We don't have to expand it all the way out, just far enough where you feel like, oh, that's a relatively easy process where you don't, have, where you feel like you can avoid messier chain quotient um, product derivative rules. Okay, so let's jump into our derivative here. My U value is X squared, so. What's my derivative? Yeah. So my rule is u prime over u. So 2x over x squared. I'll write the rule here, the reminder. Minus, okay, one half is my coefficient. Anything gonna happen to that? Just hangs out in front, right? Any coefficient in front of my variable, for my derivative, it just stays. All right, so now u prime over u for my um, natural log expression, 2x cubed becomes yeah, divided by 2x cubed. Okay, do some cleanup. There's no need to find a common denominator. I'm just going to clean up my individual fractions. The x's can go away within my first fraction. This uh, six over four, which reduced to be three halves, and I can also take out one of the x's. That's good enough. That's fine. No, nope. as long as you find some derivative. Um, yeah, usually with logs, we're going to see log problems tomorrow where, or sorry, Monday, or Tuesday, where we're going to have a lot of multiple terms and it's OK. Just leave it all as one big mess. As long as you have the derivative correct, um, there's no common denominator that we have to go through. OK, there's two more I want to do with you, and then we can look at a chapter three review. Uh, if you guys can flip over to page five. And we'll do um, problem 49 and 50. OK, so we want to find the derivative, but anytime I see a natural log expression, I'm always thinking, OK, if it looks complicated, maybe I can take the time to. To split them up into easier, easier um, problems. So. Do you see a property? I mean, this is a pretty messy derivative rule to go through, right? Product and chain rule. Uh, I want to try to avoid it. Is there a property that I can use to get those into smaller parts? Product property, right? So there's my A value. There's my B value. Natural log of AB expands into natural log of A plus natural log of B. There's more that I can do with that second expression to make it easier for me to work with. What can I do with that second expression? Parentheses to the. Yeah. Okay, what property can I use? To continue cleaning up. Yeah, that exponent, that power probably can come down in front. I'm still in my cleanup stage. I haven't touched my derivative yet. I'm just rewriting this. So right now, this is going to be the exact same value as what I started with, but a lot easier to work with from a derivative perspective. Okay. 
So now u prime over u feels a lot easier, right? Because now our u value doesn't have anything attached to it to make it more complicated than just tolerable. Okay. Y prime equals natural log of x becomes one over x. Yep, u prime over u. One half stays. X squared minus one becomes. Yeah. Looks like I can take out one of the twos because they are not attached to any addition or subtraction. They're simply divided by one another. One another. Okay, that's good enough for our derivative. Okay, try number 50. Same procedure, same process. See if you can work your way through there. Again, 50 is a that's a messy new value to work with. So but we're under the umbrella of natural log, so we can take advantage of these nat these uh, expansion properties to make our derivative easier. Okay, product property like number 49. You got your A, you got your B value. So once you split them up. You can bring that exponent down in front, and then you can do u prime over u for your remaining terms. Uh, I want to do uh, one review problem um, for uh, for Monday's test. So let me ask you, which one do you feel like you you would prefer to see? An optimization problem with a box or a derivative graph where you have to graph the function and the second derivative? Optimization? OK, all right, let's do an optimization. So uh, if you guys can get a sheet of paper uh, or if you need scratch sheet, I have uh, some up here. OK, so um, this is now a closed box, OK? A closed box, meaning that uh, we have material for all six sides. Closed box whose base length is twice that of the base width. 
the bottom is made of more expensive material, $10 per square foot. The sides and the top are made of cheaper material, $4 per square foot. Box is to have 75 cubic feet of space. That's related to what? What's that referring to? Volume. Determine the dimensions of box that minimizes the cost and go ahead and find that cost. You know you're working with surface area because that is what you're trying to optimize, right? Because you know that the cost is related. Well, first off, we want to optimize cost, and cost is going to be related to your surface area because you're not paying for the space inside the box. You're paying for the material that makes up the box, which is surface area. So we need we need to find the area of the surfaces, and then we have to work in the um, cost into that area. So surface area. Area of the six surfaces, so we have to account for all six sides. Let's start the base here. What's the area of that base? Now, in this case, we also have a top, right? So another 2x squared. What's the area of my sides? XH and XH. I have two of them. I have one that's on the other side. And then the front is two dollars. And the back is So now we can work in the cost. And we can multiply each of the sides by how much they're going to cost per square foot. The bottom here is ten dollars, but everything else is okay, put all that together. But there's still something that we have to deal with before we jump into the derivative. We need some help. Because how many variables are we still going to end up on the right side? Two, right? So looks like that H is going to be the one that is the easier one to replace. So once I combine all my terms together, I get 28x squared plus 24xh. What can I use to help me? Or what's my secondary equation that's going to help me replace that H? Uh, volume, yeah. So I have volume, which is 10 cubic meters. Right, so 10. Oh, sorry, 75, 75 cubic feet. But we also need to build the, uh, our volume formula, right? What's the volume of this box? Formula two, two yeah, length, width, height, two x squared H. Solve for H, then we can have a substitution for the H here. And then once you get your cost equation down to one variable on the right side, then it just feels like you're finding uh, uh, a critical point, right? Get it cleaned up, get it ready for power rule, find the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for X. And when you solve for X, you're done with all the calculus part and you're done with creating anything. You're just, after you solve for X, you're just reading the problem again and see, okay, where does that X go so I can provide the information the problem is asking for? Is it asking for dimensions? Is it asking for width? Is it asking for length? Is it asking for the cost? You're just plugging into one of your established equations already. You're not creating anything once you get to X. Okay, so see if you finish those steps there.
So I got my uh, volume equation to all the way down to H equals 37.5 over X squared. That's a perfect substitution for the H that's sticking out on my cost side. So I take my cost equation, clean it up, multiply the uh, numbers through, divide one of the x's, and I'm left with 28x squared plus 900 over x. There's more that I can do with that in terms of cleaning it up. So I want that x to come out to the top to make it easy so I can do the power rule instead of the quotient rule. So I brought that 900x, uh, sorry, x to the top as x to the negative one. And now that I have my cost equation, I'm ready for my derivative, right? This is nicely set up for power rule. So find your derivative, power rule, set equal to zero. And then just algebraically try to find a way to solve for x. All right, so I cross multiplied once I got them on the, the different sides of the equation. Divided by 56, take the cube root, solve for x. So the problem is asking for dimensions and cost. So I have one of the dimensions, right? X is one of the, the dimensions. That's the width. Right, to find a length, I can just take that X and double it. And do I have a formula for H? Yeah, 37.5 for X squared, right? Just Right. Once you solve for X, you shouldn't have to create anything. Everything that you need is is somewhere in um, that's already been built. And do I have a cost equation for me to to find the minimal cost? Yeah, you have a bunch of them, right? You have all of these. All five of these are fine, but I just chose the one that I felt was the easiest to, to plug in. So I use I use the 28 x squared plus 900 over x. Okay, so uh, test on Monday, I will send you guys a list of topics. Uh, it's also on my website. I'm, I'm going to put that up in a second. Uh, come up and get your phones. Help session, Monday morning, 7.15, I'll go over. Test review, uh, worksheet three in your packet. I think it's an problems, but sure. So when it says that bottom is $10, the other sides are $4 per square foot, um, and you go mm -hmm. do this, mm -hmm. you get 24 mm -hmm. minutes of each. And this is, okay. when I did that, Oh, did you make the top ten dollars as well? Yeah, I think I probably made the I see. That's great. Yeah, so I'll specify if, if the top is also the same material as the bottom, then I'll specify bottom and top is ten dollars. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. One second. Let me put this up. Yeah, you can ask me on this. Yeah. Guys, here are the test topics again. One derivative graph, one optimization, a box problem, one curve sketch problem, and then three questions uh, related from uh, from the 3.1 business work. Um, review through your quiz. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh, I just, uh, yeah. I said, I mean, we'll be done. Yeah. 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 Ye